Welcome back. Uh, we start the afternoon session, and um, as you see from the program, the afternoon session starts with um, the second track. We heard about the Digital Natives track, and now we're going to listen to something that uh, during the course of the, of the preparation of the conference called, uh, maybe a little too abstractly, Information Infrastructure, or Informational Infrastructure. Uh, which uh, is, uh, are two words which means uh, what's the flow of information? How information is entering universities, is being processed and modified, and how information comes out of university. The track leader for this second session is Alma Swan, uh, an open access advocate, and uh, she's going to deliver the keynote for this second track, and uh, in doing so she will be cited also by Martin Hall, rector of Salford University in the UK, and by Stuart Schieber from the Berkman Center at Harvard University. Thank you, Alma. There we are. Thank you. Thank you, Juan Carlos. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I just want to say, modestly, that I was invited to do the keynote and then I was invited to be the track leader. So I just want to emphasize that I didn't put myself into the position of keynote speaker. I was already there. That would have been a terrible thing to do. Anyway, um, our track is about the information infrastructure and what we're going to be covering is all the things that underpin the communication uh, system within the um, academy. I want to start just by asking a rather simple question, which is what are universities for? And I'd like to try and keep that in the forefront of our minds as we go through this afternoon's session. Universities have been around in various forms for over a thousand years. And I actually see no reason why they shouldn't be around in various forms for another thousand. They were set up to create knowledge, to care for knowledge, by which I mean that they should be curating and providing stewardship for the knowledge that they create, and also knowledge which sometimes is created outside them, and yet they are the ones that should look after it. So they have a national stewardship role as well, maybe even international in some cases. And they pass that knowledge to society. They pass it really in two forms, in the form of know-how, as educated people and in the form of knowledge itself and that knowledge should be usable and reusable by anybody who wishes to take advantage of it. Two centuries ago or more in fact I think 1878 the first president of Johns Hopkins University asked answered that question what are universities for and he said this it's one of the noblest duties of a university to advance knowledge and to diffuse it not merely to those who can attend our daily lectures, but far and wide. And I don't believe that that mission has changed at all and should not do in the future. And yet, the activities that universities carry out today don't always live up to that mission statement. The traditional values of our universities then were enabling and encouraging intellectual endeavor they were to create scholarship or enable scholarship for its own worth. They had a collaborative spirit in the furtherance of society's interests and aims, a collaborative spirit, and a collegiate view of their community worldwide. They were our old traditional values upheld by universities over the centuries. There was a knowledge commons. Knowledge created within universities was disseminated as effectively as possible in the days of the age of print on paper by the scholarly societies and the university presses, both of which, of course, came from or emanated and were part of the academy. And they had the base values of collaboration and cooperation, sharing and generating a societal benefit from our university system. And these values were were shared across the world by the university system. Until the last few decades when things changed, 
the Bay Dole Act in 1980, which has had quite a, a, a mixed press, let's say, but a fairly terrible press from open access advocates, that's for sure, encouraged universities, and well, that was passed in the US, but there have been similar acts passed in other countries around the world, and still are being passed, by the way, India being the latest example, encourage universities to exploit their, their intellectual property. They encouraged an attitude of risk-taking, which is not a core value of the academy. And they foster, fostered a spirit of competitiveness, which far outstripped the general competitiveness that had existed before. It's quite a serious one now. The funding that came into universities from societies over the last few decades, from society, by which I mean from industrial companies, for example, has been, as Welling said, this was a man commissioned by our government in the UK to look at this whole issue, became linked to strategic priorities for those companies and specific outcomes rather than philanthropy. There was a loss then of the public service model and Stuart MacDonald at Sheffield University described the whole situation in a, in a rather woeful way as a lofty ideal which has become a lowly ambition. Secrecy has transcended sharing and we have a bias towards closedness rather than openness nowadays. The prize of all that well, a couple of years ago, somebody looked to see what had happened as a result of the Bay Dole Act and found that only 167 of over 27,000 patents held by a couple of hundred public institutions in the US have made over a million dollars. In other words, this way of looking at things and doing things is not really the stuff of the university system. It may be the stuff of a few high-flying technical universities geared up for that kind of thing, but it's not really what the academy should be focusing on. The price, as opposed to the prize, has been the compromise of the commons. It's been called the tragedy of the anti-commons by Chris Armbruster, and it's meant that dissemination of knowledge has been largely relinquished to commercial publishers, and a little NB there, are they entrepreneurial and risk-taking, or have they had a relatively easy ride through the last few decades? Even the publishers situated within the academy, the presses and the scholarly societies, are, are either commercial or behaving commercially, or are being encouraged to do so by their institutions. And so there's been a change in value. The commons has become transmuted into an attitude of ownership of knowledge and that ownership is largely outside the academy at the moment. The bulk of last century's knowledge is locked away behind proprietary toll barriers and it would be devastating if this century's knowledge went the same way. We're surrounded by permissions and rights and restrictions on what we do with the knowledge that's created within the academy Academy. It's compromising research efficacy, as I shall allude to a bit later on with an example, and it's certainly diminishing the public good. So we are hopefully now beginning the long walk back. I don't want to sound too gloomful here. We are starting on the long walk back. I think it is a long walk. Um, hopefully it will. We will get to the other end of it. There has been a revival of traditional thinking, the traditional values of the academy, and the open access movement is one part of that. The web, of course, is enabling openness in all its manifestations, and there is a vision of increased openness throughout the academy. There's all these open things that we come across now, open learning, open innovation open notebooks, open science, and so forth. We'll be discussing some of these in our breakout session tomorrow morning. Um, and there's a global knowledge creation and knowledge transfer environment, which is growing up now, um, which shares the values of the commons. Now, for the rest of my introduction here, I'm going to focus on these three topics, open access and knowledge sharing, the ownership of knowledge, and joining things up. 
I think that there are many topics that one could focus on in an introductory talk like this, but I sat down and decided that these three were the most pressing. And the other two speakers in this session are going to pick up on some of these things and illuminate them in more detail. Oh. Sorry. To start with open access and knowledge sharing then. John Palfrey this morning raised the question, if we were to start again designing universities, would we design what we already have or would we design something completely new? And his answer was that we would, given the internet, design something completely new. I would pose the same question about open access and knowledge sharing. If we were to start again, we certainly wouldn't design a system with the internet in place that said, hey, isn't it a good idea if we all work away all year, creating lots of knowledge, and then we hide it, we only allow a small percentage of people to have easy to access to that, and those people must pay for it anyway. And that's a great way to advance scholarship. Of course, we wouldn't do that. So let's start our different thinking with the open access movement. There's been 15 years of progress. Yes, progress. It's slow. It is a slow, long walk back. But we have had progress throughout those 15 years. There are now, for example, 1,700-odd repositories situated in universities and research institutes around the world. And they have been growing at a rate of one a day over the last few years. They may not yet contain everything that we would like to see them contain, but at least the infrastructure is being put in place. The same with open access journals, of which there are around about 5,000 now. Some of them started with very ambitious programs, like the publisher Public Library of Science. Other publishers with programs that were designed to demonstrate that open access could become mainstream with the right business model in place. Examples of those are Biomed Central and Hindawi. And increasingly, open access journals are being published from campus, not necessarily by the formal university presses, but from departments and research groups and even individual researchers who are taking up the open source software that's available, setting up their journals and operating on a very low cost level, of course, to transmit the knowledge in their discipline or their field around the world for nothing. There's been development on policies on open access and this is a very promising area. University leaders are starting to see the importance of open access and what it can do in a rather selfish way for their institutions in terms of raising their impact. And I believe that we are now seeing some very progressive thinking on the furtherance of research and learning in respect of what open things can do for those. The drivers for all this have been that, and this is where our theme, our track, then reaches out to some of the other themes in the conference. First of all, universities as knowledge creators, research itself is changing. It's becoming bigger, more collaborative, more interdisciplinary, it has less boundaries, and it is, of course, mediated electronically in many or most cases. So that's one big driver for open access. In fact, that kind of research cannot function properly without openness. This requires new behaviors of people, and here we're talking about the digital natives, of course, and their importance. New research methods, yes, but new attitudes towards the dissemination of the results of their work. There are new tools being developed to optimize these new things, and of course they're, they're the sort of Web 2-based collaborative networking type of tools. The digital natives, as I've said, think and behave differently to those old fogies like me, uh, who are well past their sell-by dates. I have great um, optimism, by the way, that if all open access advocates stopped advocating at the end of today, we would still have open access within a fairly short time, simply because the digital natives think it is absurd to have any other kind of a system, and they will put it in place. 
the trouble is, we want it sooner rather than later. Universities themselves need new methods and metrics for assessment, and they are all enabled by having the research literature open access and the data that underpin it. And universities are under pressure to reappear in the public space. Here's a couple of examples of directives that have come out in recent years. The European Commission, for example, asks universities to ensure that knowledge transfer forms part of their formal strategic mission. And the Wellings report, which I mentioned earlier, a report by a UK rector to the UK government a couple of years ago, said that universities should be able to demonstrate how they go about maximizing the overall impact of their research. Impact not only on the rest of the research community, but on society in general. I.e. the university sitting as a civic actor. The institutional responses to these things have been that there is now a considerable program of from campus dissemination. I don't want to call it publishing anymore. Publishing is a word which is particularly associated with a rather narrow band of activities. I think dissemination is a better word. So campuses are now starting to take control of that dissemination process. There's a lot more work to be done there, but libraries are doing very well and leading the way in many cases. There have been a couple of new words coined where libraries have become involved in dissemination activity. They've been variously called librishers or librishers or pubries, i.e. the merging of the library role with the publishing role. Institutional repositories are often the tool that libraries use to do this, but they may not be run by the library. And even if they are, the library may not be considering them to be a formal publishing tool. But nevertheless, they are playing a huge role in making sure that the dissemination of the scholarship in the institution is as wide as possible. University presses are changing, I believe. They have a difficult position that they find themselves in. Many of them, over the last few decades, have been encouraged to behave like commercial publishers and have considerable pressure on them to do that from their institutions, let alone outside. But we are seeing new developments in thinking by university presses. One of the big European projects going on at the moment, most of you will be familiar with that, called OARPEN. It is run by um, a group of university presses who are developing a new publishing platform and a business model to enable them to publish monographs, academic monographs, online for nothing, i.e. open access, while selling the print version of them. And there is, um, as I've said, academic unit publishing. I've called it that. What I mean is these groups of people within the academy, within universities, departments, research groups, and individuals who are often now publishing open access journals of their own. And a number of I think far-sighted universities, um, mainly in the US at the moment, but hopefully this will spread, are establishing formal offices of scholarly communication to encourage and to enable this new openness, which they have seen in those institutions, is going to stand the institution in good stead itself and to help it return to those old values that we used to treasure. I would like actually to see some of these offices called something a little bit wider than scholarly communication, but nevertheless, I um, totally think that they are a good idea. But there is much more to do in this sense, much more to do within institutions. The battleground is now in the university. The arguments have been made, the evidence has been collected. We know that openness is the right way forward. Funders and governments have largely agreed with that but the academy itself is not moving fast enough and we need to change the thinking of the people at the top. Digital repositories are one way of doing that, of course. They are increasingly interoperable, by which I mean that they have lots of technical things in place now to make deposit easier, to make talking between the 
repositories easier and to make sure that there is a collection of repository content available for the whole world through, for example, Google Scholar. These repositories deliver, deliver variously in different universities, open education programs, making many universities rather edgeless. That's a, um, a term, a title of a book that was published last year in the UK about open education and how universities should be looking towards a future where they are delivering many of the things that they currently do on campus, delivering them online, outside national boundaries across the world. Uh, repositories also are delivering or reaching out to traditional and new communities in the wider world. So this is our civic actor role of universities. They are reaching out to people locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. I'm talking here about industrial companies, commercial companies, the professional and the practitioner sectors, and the lay public. Are we rather, it sounds a bit condescending to call the public the lay public. In many cases, of course, as I've put in brackets here, the lay public is proving anything but lay and is once the tools are in place, has shown itself to be very willing to join in the research effort being conducted through the universities. And a couple of examples of that are Galaxy Zoo and Einstein at Home. Very nice examples, those two, of where the public is being, the, the power of the public and its computers are be, is being harnessed uh, to further research. Joining up is an issue, I think, and I think that we have not gone very far along this road. We have, of course, the grid and we have the web, which are helping the big um, e-research programs, the big science programs, and we have some formal networking systems too. We also have a growing body of campus profiling systems, Vivo, which was developed in Cornell, but is now spinning out to other universities, including a group in the United States which is now using this tool. The purpose of it is to enable people who are looking for collaborators, these are researchers, looking for collaborators outside their field to help them with research which is interdisciplinary and for which they need aid from experts outside their own area of expertise. Vivo is a very good example of that. Cornell set it up because it recognized that it was a big university that people working in biomedicine never met, let alone talked to the physicists. The physicists never met, let alone talked to the archeologists or the geologists. So this is an online tool. It's meant to network up the campus and allow people to search out put potential collaborators. Vivo is now with a rather ambitious project being adopted by a group of US universities and the same in Australia. I think these kinds of things are going to be increasingly necessary as time goes on, as research gets bigger and as its interdisciplinarity grows. We have larger domain networking systems too. The best example perhaps, and I think the one that's proving to be the most popular at the moment, academia.edu. And of course, we have the digital natives informal networks. Um, the academy does not have control over those at the moment, I don't think. It may have even less in the future. I think this relates to some of the points that in John's session this morning that were being discussed. Does that matter? Discuss. Having said all that, I do think that campuses have much, much, much more work to do to join this picture up in a sensible way. Even on one campus, we find that there are web pages that do not tally with other web pages, that the, there's a repository that doesn't talk to the current research information system, and that the whole business is not joined up in a way that benefits the institution gives a better return on investment than having all these things run individually as standalone systems. 
there is much more work to do just in one in individual universities, let alone seeing the return from networking people properly across academia. And finally, knowledge ownership. We have moved, as I've said, from a system of access and sharing in the old days to a system of toll barriers and a bias towards secrecy and closedness. And we need to fight our way back from that. As I've said, we've lost last century's knowledge. I hope in many disciplines that won't matter, but I know that in some disciplines it matters very much. There are attitudes that we have to overcome, that these will change because the digital natives think in new ways. But copyright is still with us. And that is a very worrying issue at the moment, particularly in the US and Europe, where some very serious moves are afoot to change uh, the copyright protection. Stuart is going to develop this in his talk in a minute. But I just want to say a few words about what I've learned about how copyright is affecting knowledge and learning through some projects that we've done over the last few years. It does, in obvious ways, have effects upon knowledge dissemination. We know that, otherwise we wouldn't be fighting for open access. But it has less obvious ways too. For example, there are e-textbooks and e-other kinds of books which have to have the speech turned off in some places because the license doesn't allow it, which means that visually impaired people are debarred from using those knowledge sources. It has an effect on knowledge creation. One senior researcher told me that she has had to change the program of her research, which is in the humanities, by the way, not science, in the humanities, because the cost of accessing the material she needs to study, which is to do with ancient Greece, is prohibitive. She also told me that it is affecting her teaching. She wanted to teach students about one Greek poem and the copyright rules and permissions from the publisher allowed her to use two words of it in a class. Two words of a long Greek odyssey, which demanded that the students saw the whole thing right in front of them and were given time to reflect and contemplate on the meaning of the work. It's nonsense, isn't it, when we get to a situation like that. It's skewing research and teaching the reason I told you those two particular examples is that that lady works at the Open University in the UK, a university which has, as part of its services to its researchers and teachers, a huge department which sorts out copyright problems for those people because of its history and the way it's always worked. It does have that resource, and yet even it can't overcome some of these things. It's time to recalibrate the IP rules for the digital age, said the US Committee for Economic Development, and went on to say that when we find university presses using copyright protection to prevent dissemination, university presses using copyright protection to de prevent dissemination, it is time to step back and revisit not only the specific applications of the rules, but the rules themselves. There are ways around copyright in some cases, and Stuart will be telling us about those. I'm not the expert, but he is. So I'm going to finish there and pass the floor to him. And after that, Martin Hall, who is, as you've heard, rector at Salford University, is going to give us his perspective from being a university manager, university leader, on how perhaps to try to tie up some of these ends and and take a more holistic view of it from a university sense. Thank you.